John Church. Uh, I'm an architectural historian and also the, uh, I, I served as the curator of urban history for the Newport Historical Society. And The Artful City, uh, the book I've worked on, was born of the idea that Newport is such a historically intact community that it has stories to tell. Many people think of it as a place of memory. And what do we really mean by that? Because every place can be a vessel of our memories. Newport, because it has so many layers of history through its buildings and its streets, is both a place of memory, I feel, individually for each of us, but also collectively. It is known as a historic storied place. So my interest is to cast Newport within the history of urban design. How did people settle the land, lay out the land, and how did that reflect the economic, social, political, religious, cultural forces, you know, that shape our lives. Because culture and history is complex. And after the city is developed, or while it's developing, each district has a tale to tell about the period that created it, and then ensuing periods that evolved it, changed it. But then beyond the physical aspect of the city is the cultural response to it. How did people respond? How did it inspire? And Newport is a storied place in that as well, because writers, artists, um, uh, photographers, all through the camera, the pen, the paintbrush, uh, created a myth around the city. Uh, sometimes it was factual history, but other times it was this invention of Newport as a historic place. And in that lies an interesting cultural study of each section reading like a history book on certain aspects, certain, mind you, of American settlement patterns in certain periods. And the other is how we cast a place and how we ascribe value to that. And why do the meanderings of the minds uh, and imaginations of artists and writers matter? We could relegate their romantic views to the ivory tower or to their studio. But in Newport, it played out in a certain way because by ascribing value to the streets and buildings and spaces of Newport, they were agents actually of how people viewed the place and they, in, in, an, in an indirect way, aided in the preservation of that very place. We begin our story in Washington Square, which truly encapsulates the history of Newport from the period of European colonial settlement when they came upon this land, which of course already had evidence of centuries, unrecorded, human, uh, unrecorded centuries of human settlement uh, pr uh, prior to European intervention. In 1524, Giovanni de Verrazzano sailed into Newport Harbor uh, while he was on an expedition uh, in the New England seaboard. And he recorded a settled land, a land of cultivation. And so there were already uh, human populations here with a resourceful use of the land. This was not a virgin wilderness. It's a European observation. And then when European colonists settled Newport in 1639, granted permission by the native population to settle here, they began to gather around the area known as Washington Square today, also in farmlands to the south and throughout the entire area. And as early as 1640, the governing council said, you must lay out the street in regular patterns. And so as we look upon this map done in 1777 by Charles Blaskowitz, we see colonial Newport, Newport of that colonial era at its height. And if we think about what this map means for many different people, we see the street plans laid out by the European-based colonists. And it's reached its height of colonial wealth as a maritime port in the vast British Empire. You see Thames Street along the waterfront, 
Spring Street above that, and the, the triangle in the map is Washington Square. That story of Washington Square is one of foundation of this European colony, evolution over time through building, and revolution in the sense of radical change, both political, but Washington Square has survived every epoch in urban design from its original colonial evolution through radical urban renewal of the 1960s. This map shows the city literally the beginning of the American Revolution at the edge of its at least commercial abyss because Newport would suffer greatly economically after the American Revolution. You see a sense of civic pride at work in this map and that's what these plans tell us about the time. Many people had said, ah, Newport had grown to the admiration of all. That's a quote from the early 18th century. And so they very consciously included all of the public buildings within the city. But two things emerged from this map, that freedom of conscience and capitalism both reigned here. The public buildings in the map are inserted into already existing streetscapes. There is never a religious structure at the head of a Grand Avenue or a city square or, a, or any kind of green scape, such as Colonial Williamsburg, where government buildings were consciously placed in a highly planned community. Newport was not planned that way. That is because no one religious group, no one religious sect dominated the town. And that's that value, that cultural value is reflected in the streetscapes. Also reflected is the prominence of commerce by the late 17th and early 18th centuries that wharves that dominate this plan. And you'll note the owner of the wharf is written on that wharf and the streets emanate from those wharves. Washington Square, which became the heart of the city, visually at least, was also not entirely planned in one master stroke. It evolved over time. You see that V shape. Uh, at the head of the square was a grand building, at the base of the square, a grand building. The, and the pride, of course, civic pride and cultural aspiration was very much behind the creation of these buildings, which were governmental and economic in the main square, not religious. This is a highly romantic view from the mid-19th century of Washington Square. Details of it are accurate. There are Victorian buildings on the right-hand side, but the Colony House is the key visual monument uh, in the left-hand side. Colony House was built in 1739 to 41 and was the glowing great public monument. And when one arrived in 18th century Newport on Long Wharf, one would have had a direct visual access uh, up the wharf through the square and to that grand governmental building. And that's key. It has a Baroque richness to the street. And this is Newport saying to itself, we are the, we are the subject of admiration by all. By the 19th century, already this square was influenced by the romantic mood of the moment. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, several artists and writers began to appreciate this part of Newport. You know, the colonial period was well over a century old, and there's nothing like time to cast a romantic glow or a mythic glow on the past the further away it gets. Henry James, in his uh, essay, The Sense of Newport, wrote about this cobbly area around the old state house, referring to the colony house, and inferred that if one listened carefully, one could hear the steps of colonial ghosts. The French officers who occupied Newport during the revolution, he's giving Newport this rich character, romantic mind, but he's summoning up the past in a literary way. The leading architect, Charles Fallon McKim, who in the 1870s was designing, and in the 1880s was designing uh, very avant-garde, what we would call shingle-style houses in Newport, was being inspired by what he called the old colonial town and commissioned the earliest known set of photographs in American history of colonial structures in Newport. He photographed the back of the colony house with a jumble of vernacular shingle buildings behind it. He wasn't having the formal front photographed. He loved this picturesque jumble of shingled textures, gabled roofs, 
clients and the Grand Colony House beyond it. And so this part of town is inspiring artists who have a romantic view of it, but here he then is turning these decorative details he's seeing in the great buildings into his contemporary architect at the time.